Welcome to an unusual journey down a less travelled byway of Ulster culture. Some people see Ulster as the six counties of Northern Ireland. Some see it as the nine counties. But did you know that some saw Ulster as having ten counties? They were the stalwarts of the Ulster dialect of Irish, which included the Gaelic of County Louth. Irish was spoken all over Ulster at one time, but today it survives as a living community language in the Donegal Gaeltacht, where it is the language of the home, the school and the church. I'd like to look at an important book written in Ulster Irish, none less than the Four Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. The same man who translated these produced a mass book, which has other selections from the Bible. We'll also hear of the remarkable story of the translator. I was in the spirit of the link, I was in the spirit of the Lord, 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 the Lord. Here we are at the Skeno Center in East Belfast. And here with me today is Mr. Marcus McFadgey, who heads up Antara Lassu, an Irish speaking Christian group which is based in Fitzroy Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Skenos, Marcus. Thanks very much, Bran. Now, Marcus, um, could you tell us a bit about what it stands for and its significance? Okay, well, it means the burning bush, which of course is the symbol of the Presbyterian Church. And uh, we got set up in around 1997, and it was the time when the Erectus, which is a major Irish language festival, came to Belfast. And we were asked, at least uh, Bill Boyd, who was also involved in setting things up, was asked if it would be possible to have a Protestant church service in Irish alongside the Catholic one as part of the Erectus Festival. So we, we got together with a group of interested people and we managed to put on um, a, a church service, um, uh, which was extremely well attended. I think as far as church services go, and I don't think we've had such a well-attended one since then, to be perfectly honest. So we've kept on going since uh, 1997, and we try and have kind of services in the, the main church building at Christmas and Easter, and then on the third Sunday of most months, we have a, a, a smaller service in a, in a, smaller, a smaller space just uh, inside the church and we we do all the normal things that happen in a Presbyterian church service. Are you familiar with the translation, the Irish translations of the Bible? Yes, yeah, so uh, we, we have used uh, various different uh, translations but the, 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 the fullest one I suppose is the one that the Catholic Church did in the 1980s which is this one here uh, and it's sometimes called the Maynooth Bible. Um, I have seen obviously others, there was a we sometimes use this one, which was a, a Church of Ireland uh, canon uh, called Casa do Quinn, who uh, put this together about 1970. And then, most recently, we've been experimenting a little bit with uh, Padre uh, Magilla Cara's translation, because it is, uh, I suppose, closer to the Irish that most of us have tried to learn uh, in this part of the world. So uh, he tried to to put together a kind of a, something that would be useful to Ulster Irish speakers. So it's a, a, a modern, a, not a modern dialect, but a local dialect? Yeah, so uh, it was something that was put together in, I think around, I'm not quite sure of the date, but around the middle of the last century. And he came from Fanad Head, so he was a native uh, Irish speaker. So that was a, um, a real benefit, I think, to have somebody that uh, was sort of steeped in the, in the Gaelic tradition and uh, was, was able to kind of, and had uh, the sort of uh, the learned background as a, as a priest to, to put together uh, a translation that kind of reflected the, the speech of people in, uh, in Ulster, essentially. Could you give us some examples of uh, that appeal to you in that translation? Yeah, uh, certainly. I mean, I could read you a, a small section out of it. One of our, uh, the, the minister in, in Fitzroy, who isn't an Irish speaker, but uh, is, is very taken with uh, the very positive message in the, in the Gospel of John, and particularly um, John 10.10. 10. So maybe I, if I, I read you a little bit about, the, about that. So it's, it's this passage about, I have come that you might have life, and life in all its fullness. 
is mise an daras mas trimsa a rachas in ye christiach snanachare agus rachisha stiach agus amach agus yoisha dahu ni hig an gadi ach ag ach agus awaru agus a villu a chanig mise chan gumeu daha aku agus gumed she aku nis omlunya is mise an tera mai ver an tera mai a vaha er son a chirach so uh, obviously there there are quite interesting things in that uh, little bit of Irish. Um, he he uses um, arachis instead of arachi that would be in the the sort of standard Irish. Um, so it's what what tends to happen if someone is uh, reading from the the Maynooth Bible is that they have to be. They have to kind of almost change the grammar rules as they're as they're reading through it and make little minor changes in what they're saying, uh, which it isn't necessary to do with this one to, to be kind of uh, dialect correct, I suppose. Marcus McFadgey, thank you very very much indeed for your contribution today. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks very much. Dugania wine, virtue, feed and spirit, brihar na hagne. Doganya ele an omod kinyal changa. Doganya ele minu kanche. Well, here we are on the first floor of the Maclay Library at Queen's University in the Special Collections and Archives Unit. Now, with me today is John Duffy, author of a little gem of a booklet entitled The History of the Bible in Irish. And Elizabeth I commissioned that a New Testament be produced in Irish. It was William O'Donnell who, who took up the mantle and he then got with the help of Myrta um, King, he, he got the, the translation finished and eventually got it printed. Um, it was, they printed all the, the pages in 1602, um, but they, they printed the, the cover page, the title page in 1603 in between. Elizabeth died, um, and so the, the title page is dedicated to James I on 1603. But could you talk about the Beadle Bible? Yeah, um, I mean firstly the man, um, William Beadle, was, uh, he was in his 50s when he was basically told to come over to Ireland. Um, he was. He was brought over first as Provost of Trinity College in Dublin, and a few years later became Bishop of Kilmore and Arda. But he was, uh, although he was an Anglican, um, although he was a planter in the eyes of the Irish, um, the, the native Irish, and although he was ministering in churches which had been taken from them uh, over, during the Reformation and uh, became Church of Ireland churches, Although he had all the wrong credentials, he was a godly man. He loved God and he loved people. And he loved the poor and he cared for the poor. He loved the Irish people and he loved their language as a result. In fact, he was essentially a Puritan at heart, as one person has written. Um, and Coleridge, the historian, said that he was the most faultless character in all of ecclesiastical history. So he was, a, he was a godly man, so much so that at his death, people on both sides mourned his death. You know, the priests were there at the graveside, and even during the 1641-42 uh, uprising, uh, as he was being buried, uh, a group of um, rebels came up with muskets uh, and a drum, and they gave him what you could probably call a military funeral. They fired their muskets at his graveside and they said in Latin, rest in peace, the best of the English. And so he was a great man himself. A name that most uh, school children will be f familiar with, at least secondary school children, the scientist Robert Boyle. They, lots of people know about Boyle's Law. He was keen on promoting the Bible, not just um, in the language that might have been dominant, but in the language of the, the, that the people spoke in a memorable year in 1690. <laughs> he, um, he put the two of them together 
in uh, the first complete Bible in Gaelic ever. It didn't happen throughout the whole of the Celtic Church here, the land of saints and scholars, but it was 1690 of the first Gaelic Bible. Can you talk a bit about the Second Reformation and revival in Irish? Yeah, the, the First Reformation in Ireland came uh, with the plantation and the, the, the religion of the reformers didn't go down too well, not because of what it was, but because of who it was brought by. The Second Reformation in Ireland was essentially in the early 1800s where the, you just had the, the modern missionary movement start um, just several years before that and sort of the, the birth of evangelicalism. That resulted in lots of publications. People got interested in, in reaching the, the, the Irish, the Catholic Irish um, and, and trying to convert them to the Protestant faith. And one way to try and reach them was to, to print loads of publications in, in Irish, the Bible in Irish. Maybe it's the four Gospels in Irish, the four Gospels in Acts, maybe it's a single Gospel or the, a reprint of the New Testament. As um, Cardinal O'Fee wrote in the introduction to the, the Minuth Bible in 1981, that the, the English Bible uh, was, as it was called, the Englishman's Bible, even though it was written in Irish, <laughs> was denounced from many a pulpit and confined to many a bonfire. <laughs> so th there was what was called the Bible Wars, you know, the, with the birth of evangelicalism and the modern missionary movement coming to Ireland. It sadly degenerated into anti-Catholicism. The second translation of the Bible into Irish, Irish in 1981, yeah. Monsignor of Fenicta. Yeah, he did a lot of the translation, but, and he was editor-in-chief as well. Mm -hmm. And he did so much work that um, Cardinal O'Fee said it's, it's, you know, maybe just like the Old um, Testament and the, the, was known as the Beatle Bible, maybe this one should be known as the, the Fenicta Bible. <laughs> Padraig McGillicara, his uh, translation of the, the Four Gospels and Acts, um, he, was a, he was a Catholic priest who went to, to war as a chaplain during the First World War uh, in the army and experienced some, some significant and harrowing scenes there. And, and he wrote about how it impacted the, the soldiers as well as civilians. After he came back, he had translated um, the, the Four Gospels and Acts into Irish, and that was eventually published um, during the next war, in the middle of the next war. It was no mean feat to publish that in 1943. Mm -hmm. And that's been renowned for its, its flowing, colorful Irish. Uh, and uh, the dialect doesn't seem to have been too much of a, an issue. One reviewer said it's, it's almost suitable to be used as standard Irish, um, but it's, it's well respected for, for the quality of the language that he used. He was a great writer. Agus nara chlanhishiv fachogu, agus fachurus gwala cogu, na bi wogla arav. Oras egin dan a nyehishin neve an, ach nyehe en diru ega foy. As a volunteer Catholic chaplain in the British Army, Father Carr captured the horror and carnage in letters written in Irish and English from the front line. Um, I came across Father Kerr um, through, there's a brilliant uh, biographical site in Irish called Anyampunk.ie, it's not, or Anyam.ie, but it was previously a, a series of books. And there was this entry on Padraig Magilla Chiara, and there was, a, there was a note about his letters from the First World War. So I, I was, you know, fascinated by this. Uh, and, uh, and that was my how my interest started in him. But in terms of his formative years, he was born in a place called Fanage in northwest Donegal. A uh, very picturesque. There's a there's a, a lighthouse there, and you know, lovely sort of coastal area, sort of picture postcard territory, you know. Um, and uh, and he was he was he was brought up in a very strong Irish language speaking community. Um, he was clearly somebody who was very 
you know, uh, religious for, for, from a young age, and he 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 decided to go and study to be a priest. Um, but his formation, I mean, some of the th- he he uh, in later writings he he goes back to some of the things that he, he learned in Fanage, for example, a, a, a religious poem that his mother uh, used to recite and, and so on called Dan and Tur, uh, the 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 uh, the poem of the basically the, the bush where there's a there's a you know. Uh, uh, this dialogue from a sort of between a lost soul and a, a sort of a, a traveler on the road, and this this lost soul has been cast out into you know eternity for their sins or whatever you know. So it's quite dramatic, and you see you see in his own writing when he describes the First World War. Obviously, you wouldn't need much stimulus to be dramatic about the First World War if you're on the front and you you know tons of you know lead coming your direction. But he did have this sort of uh, let's say imaginative. Uh, sort of a bent as well and I think that some of that comes from his, his formation in, in terms of the, uh, the the very strong religious background that he had as well I think that that, that that developed over time How did he end up becoming an army chaplain? He went into the priesthood and he was ordained and stu- he studied at Maynooth too did he? Was he... he? He did Brian this is the thing yeah he studied at Maynooth and then he went on to be uh, a lecturer in divinity after that and I uh, so he was he was a, he was very intellectual, but at the same time he was a very very down to earth and seems to be a sort of a people person. And there's a lot of you know people's memories of him sort of indicate that all the time. You know when you speak to people who who knew him uh, and so on, and you read uh, memoirs of him. But but just he he started to be a priest uh, in Manuthi, he was ordained and so on. And then with uh, the the outbreak of the First World War, there was this shortage of of Catholic chaplains and. Um, and for Catholics, one of the things that was very important was confession and, and the last rites. So, and, and also just, you know, uh, spiritual guidance and so on. So the uh, uh, Cardinal Logue put out a, a, a sort of a, an appeal to young priests to, to become chaplains. And there's also a great reaction to what had been happening in Belgium and this, this, this uh, you know, small Catholic country where there was, you know, the slaughter of, of innocence and so on. And uh, so there was a reaction to that as well. In a way, it's so relevant to me to the, the present day because he's saying, look, you know, OK, cameras make you think that you can experience things, but until you actually are here, Nobody will know what this is like. So the experience that those men had, I mean, like, you know, Battle of the Somme, 60,000 slaughtered in one day. I mean, imagine, imagine that. I mean, you can't really, nobody can really understand that except people who, who actually saw that, what what that was like. But when he tries to, to describe it, it's interesting. He says, an artillery, an artillery duel at night is a spectacle that cannot be surpassed in its appalling splendour and magnificent horror. Hundreds of guns are in discordant chorus, howling, booming, barking and belching forth their fire and vapour. The whole earth trembles with a vibrating cannonade. The flashes of the guns illumine with trembling light, the darkness of night, while star shells throw a light like the brightness of day over the combatants and meteor-like rockets having all the colours of the spectrum enhance the weird beauty of the display while they conveyed to friends their secret messages. But the beauty of the spectacle is like the beauty of the serpent. This idea that that humanity has brought itself to this stage where they're now destroying themselves, you know, and it's it's very relevant to, you know, today. climate change and all of the things yeah. that we we know today, you know. Lenolik vien tafren ogniskibal naru alia kudihe. Mi fuk nevus an air, agus yoga, be venik me vere gan wohu agus meg torch na kamenya banihe, agus be venik liak shakan sa khalish salamo an tafren rache. Akla Nalik, we may hapel lunch nachte. Honig is do ever cosserish a night to Rogu mock jail. We in Mioru Kierneg the Sidery, Agusta Megare of the Warshin, grow erred crafacht, Agus Ja Hollis a skibble, and Lashin, Agus a via de Pubble or be real. Here we are at Dunlui Church of Ireland Church, or the ruins. We stand amid the ruins of the church. It was built by a, a lady called Russell uh, in commemoration of her husband James. It's St. Patrick's Day, and we stand in the heart of the Gaeltacht in Donegal. And as we look around, we see 
the glory of God. God has manifested himself in the things that he has made, namely his eternal power and deity. Glachid Gege in the Baim, a Gusquisha the Mach in the Arakish, a Gusiedic Skarti, Hosanna is Bani in Che, Teg Chach, the Nanyam in Chirna, Re Israel. Well, here we are at the Church of Christ the King at Gordahawk in County Donegal, the very centre of the Gaeltuck. And I have with me Paddy McMiniman, the grand nephew of Father Padraig Megilla Cara. Right. How you doing, oh, Patrick? Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, and happy St. Patrick's oh, Day, by the way. Look, can I ask you, what are your earliest recollections of Father Carr? My biggest memory of, of the, the man was when I was about maybe six, seven years old, and he used to regularly go down swimming uh, during the summer and, and in the place where he was born in Fath, because he would have the summers off and he was a, you know, president of the unions at the time, so he had plenty of spare time, so he spent a lot of weeks in Fanon. And I used to toddle behind him as a little boy, you know, and he would be very often reading his uh, portas, as they called it, the breviary. And very often he knew I would be behind him anyway, and I wouldn't go near the water, it was well water. You know. And at one occasion I went behind the sand dunes to pick up shells and that. But then he suddenly realised I wasn't there anymore and the panic set off. And of course I was panicking too, you know. So uh, he, he rushed back to, and he met the people in his house and they were out in the street and that. But then thankfully a neighbouring man saw me running along the beach, you know, beside me. And he, I remember him of that image in my mind with his donkey and there was the two creels or panniers as they call them in the West. So I remember him jumping off the, the rocks and diving onto the water and I was very impressed by that. Oh, yeah, it must yeah. have been fairly handy oh, yeah, swimming. Yeah. Yeah. Because the local people weren't too keen on swimming at all. They might yeah. roll the trouser legs up and just go through a paddle, you know. <laughs> You know, he went in head first. Uh, <laughs> the nearer you are to the sea, the worse you are at swimming, you know. And tell me, what did your family think? And what was your family's impression of uh, the, Father Carr? Well, they had great affection for him because he was very down to earth. He had no, no hard notes in there with him, no big wind at all. You know, he was a man of the people because he was never interested in driving or that. So in the summers, he spent a lot of time you know, walking to houses a few miles away and going in for the tea and having a crack in that. And my mother was very fond of him because it was through him that she got the chance to become a nurse because uh, he, he funded her to go to secondary education and let her Kenny in the convent. People locally and, and, and fan it had good time from that end. And they'd be very proud of him too because priests were quite scarce. You know. and he was no mean scholar either, wasn't he? He was a very bright well, fellow. Well, he got a scholarship from the primary school which enabled him to go to the Literary Institute in, in uh, Letterkenny. And he, he, his time straddled the opening of St. Eunan's, if you know what I mean. He was about third year in the Literary Institute when St. Eunan's opened, so uh, rather than disturbing them, they let them finish their course, and then everybody then went to St. Eunan's, you know. He, of course, expressed a wish to become a priest, so the, the diocese funded him because they, he, they wouldn't have the money. Mm -hmm. There was barely viable wee farms down in most of the coastal areas in Dorigal at the time, and he wouldn't have the funds. But unfortunately, he did, you know, get help from the diocese. He was a, he was a British Army chaplain during the First World War. Um, yeah. Did he speak much about the experiences of war? He would not speak about, you know, the, the, the horrid close-up experiences they had. He must have seen some awful sights yeah. in his time. You know, the carnage that was there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it was, even in his writings, it was pretty general, more about the destruction of the, the landscape and that. Mm -hmm. He kind of kept away from the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the blood and guts, you know. Mm -hmm. There's no better way of calling it. It was a horrible war. Mm -hmm. His regiment actually presented him with a, with a gift, uh, didn't they, they? An appreciation they of his a, services. They gave him a little clock. <laughs> That's the one there. Amazing. Uh, it's a nice brass cover on it. Yeah, like a travel clock. Yeah. There's a kind of a romantic story going about that they, they got a shell that was discarded or spent and took it to a clock maker and he cobbled it up and made a clock out of it. But that was, I would say there were fairly, every, I would say every chaplain at the time 
probably got one of these from his regiment. That's yeah. nice. That's a nice. Very nice indeed. indeed. Very, very nice. He's very fond it's of that. Hefty too. Give it to my mother. <laughs> We're outside this beautiful church at the minute, uh, the Church of Christ the King, yeah. and he was really was a driving force behind the building of this, wasn't he? He was indeed, yeah. He came here in 1948 and this was opened in 1953, uh, I think it was. Uh, it was a big effort, it took a lot out of him because fundraising was difficult, you know, just after the war. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of help came, and most of it, I would say, from local people who'd gone to America and that, and there was, oh, there was a lot of big effort made by the locals to, to together up, you know. Mm -hmm. He was a pretty brilliant linguist. Now, what led him to translate the Gospels and the Acts into Donegal Irish? Oh, there'd be a fair wee bit of resentment at the time about the fact that uh, in the language revival, Munster was seen as the, the standard. And it's probably through no spite. Munster would be in a well-off province, good land, trade, commerce abroad, and with Cork there, Limerick, and it would probably be seen as the second to Dublin in importance. Mm -hmm. That was the result then that they didn't, Ulster and Connemara people, the Galway people, didn't like to see their, their cannons being discarded, you know. Mm -hmm. Cardinal Thomas O'Fee talks as a schoolboy of actually reading uh, the translation of Father C C Carr's uh, yes. Gospels. He talked about the mellifluous strains of Donegal Irish. <laughs> he said he lapped it up yeah, as a schoolboy. Of course, of course he would, sure. <laughs> and of course we come of course to his death and you were, yes. you were very young when he died. Have you any memories of the impact of his death in the wider community here? Well, I remember the, you know, I remember the night he died. Uh, I would have been just seven coming eight, 1955. And I remember the crowd in the room and the great grief as he was dying. And I became upset mainly because I didn't understand the concept of people dying very much, but I mm -hmm. could see grown up people crying and it mm -hmm. upset. He you know, wasn't just an, an intellectual dreamer that way. Mm -hmm. He was fond of the people because mm -hmm. he was you know, born in humble circumstances mm -hmm. himself, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, Patrick McManaman, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for your time. And again, I say to you, thank you so much and a happy St. Patrick's thank Day. Thank you. God bless God you. Love, Brian. This is the Golden Book of Gorda Hork, and it contains the names of all those people who contributed to the building of the church. And we have people, local people from Chairman, from Fanad, and here's one from Philadelphia. So this church was built on the efforts and endeavors of people who lived locally and also those who had been forced to emigrate. This book, it is rumored is second only to the Lamb's Book of Life, which is in heaven. Slogu and bias some way. A wash kawal the way, a wash kawal the yalog. Here we are at the last resting place of Father Carr, and just he died as he as he lived, uh, modestly and quietly in the midst of his parishioners waiting for the last trump and the resurrection. Push a Swiss the Grand Hikimura Honea Ekel, Margarosila Dalhart the Balashin. Is the Gark Swiss the Isa a chat on the head to the Honekshi A a good Dortlish? A hekeish, Taranus Gatapi, or a Sagan do Kony a Yanu in the Hisa in you. Well, here I am standing under a sycamore tree, surrounded by the beauty of mountains in, in the Gael Tucked in Donegal. Now this is a very special tree. And you ask yourself, well why? How is it special? Okay, John McGowan, who was 18 years old, signed up for the British Army, 
the Royal Monster Fusiliers. And he ended up in Gallipoli, in the Dardanelles, where he was wounded in the hand. So he came back home again, and he planted this sycamore tree. He wanted his family to remember him, just in case he never came back again. It must have been a premonition because, indeed, he never came back again. But there's a sequel to it. In June 2013, Diddy McKinley represented the Republic of Ireland at the Somme Commemoration Service in France. And before he went, he was approached by John's nephew, Paddy, who asked him to find out where the grave, his uncle's grave was. And he took a branch of this tree and he gave it to Denny McGinley, who subsequently found the grave in a place called Etable Military Cemetery in the Pas de Calais. And he found the grave of 5169 Private J. McGowan, Royal Munster Fusilier. And there he placed a branch of this same sycamore tree on that grave. Now, if that doesn't turn your heartstrings, I don't know what will. Thanks to John Duffy and his colleagues, we can read Father Carr's Gospels on the address shown on the screen. Also, the Maynooth Bible is available as an app called Anbibla Nifa, which you can download to your phone, tablet or computer.